Well, church family, if you would, while the ushers are coming by, do a couple of things for me. One is take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 9. The other is put your hand in the air. Go ahead, everybody do it. Pat yourself on the back. You made it to the 930 service this morning. Congratulations, right? Well done. Like you're here, you made it. Now, if you're coming to the nine o'clock and you slipped in, that's okay. We're not going to judge you. All right. It's, it's all good. The other thing that I want to make mention of, I just had noted in my notes. Do you realize that it was two years ago this week that we had to close everything down for COVID-19? It was two years ago this week that for the first time I stood in this pulpit and I had to learn how to be a televangelist, right? <laughs> And we had to go online exclusively. And so, man, I just want to pause to praise God that we can gather again in fullness, right? Any good to us? Yeah, praise God. It has not been an easy journey. And I know uh, there's been a lot of pain for a lot of us uh, on that journey. But I am so grateful uh, to be able to gather. And I just didn't want to let that moment slip by uh, without acknowledging God's faithfulness to us. Well, this is the first weekend for many of our families of spring break. Uh, and so if you're on the Williamson County side of things, uh, this is kind of spring break week. And so we're kind of getting into that spring holiday mode a little bit. Uh, and so of course it's spring break. So of course in Tennessee, it's going to feel like Christmas, right? Uh, here's a little graphic that just describes if you're new to Tennessee, when they ask what the weather's like in Tennessee, this is it right here. So we get all four seasons in one week around here this time of year. So just be prepared if you are a newcomer. Uh, but thankfully, it's not going to stick along, uh, uh, stick around for long. It's going to get warmer this week. And if I was to ask you what your favorite holiday was, some of you, of course, you would say it's Thanksgiving, right? It's one of my favorites because it's simple. It's food, it's family, and it's football. Amen, right? Love, love Thanksgiving. Christmas, of course, some of you love. It's the most wonderful time of the year for you guys. Some of you are patriotic. You love the 4th of July. We're in a Baptist church, so nobody's going to be honest and say Halloween is their favorite. Okay, so we know that. But in the first century, if you would have asked a first century Jew what their favorite holiday is, they would have told you this, the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles. There's a reason why. And it is the setting for the passage that we're about to read today. Every time I've told you as your pastor, right, that I dive into God's word, he shows me something new. I had forgotten, right, how Jesus performs this miracle and the setting has been the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, the reason why it says Sukkot over it is because that's the Hebrew word for booth. And the, he the Hebrew Feast of Tabernacles was designed, given by God to celebrate the fact that God had led his people right out of Egypt. And so for one week every year, they were supposed to come to Jerusalem. They were supposed to build a little booth. And so you see a modern expression of that, right? A simple tent had sides and then they would put kind of these palm branches on the top intentionally so that they could see through them, so they could see the stars and be reminded of the fact that their ancestors God had led through the wilderness in tents and so every year in this kind of a fun festival they did urban camping and they would all come together they would pack into the cities the alleyways the rooftops and families would build these little tents and they would live in them or at least eat in them during the week and so it was a festive celebration the other two major festivals of Passover and Pentecost those happened in the spring and a lot of the people who were farmers, well, they had to tend to their crops, so they didn't get to attend this one. But this one happened in the fall. And so it was like a harvest festival. And they celebrated the abundance that God had given them, and they had a blast for a week, all in Jerusalem together. And there were two things that happened every day. One of them was called the water rite. And so what would happen is the high priest, he would take this huge pitcher and he would lead a parade and they would shout and sing psalms and they would go down to the pool of Siloam. He would fill up that pitcher. He would march back up in the parade, back up to the temple steps. And there on the temple steps, he would pour out that water. One, to be reminded that in the wilderness, God provided water for the Israelites. Number two, to ask God to bring the rain again next year for the crops. The second part of that festival was fire. And so what they would do every night in the temple courts, they would have these giant candelabras, these giant torches that some historians say were as tall as the city walls themselves. And they would light them on fire and they would basically celebrate. Why? Because God had led them like a pillar of fire by night through the wilderness. And it was in the context of these two that Jesus taught that he was the living water. And in John 8, 12, he taught that he was the light of the world. Isn't that amazing to realize that? That was the context of what was happening in Jerusalem. And so the day after the festival was over, as Jesus is walking past a man born blind, he has the opportunity to perfectly illustrate that he is the light of the world. 
that he alone can bring sight to the blind. Will you stand with me in honor of God's word as we read this incredible story out of John chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. Being Jesus was passing by, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus answered. This came about so that God's works might be displayed in him. We must do the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After he said these things, he spit on the ground, made some mud from the saliva, and spread the mud on his eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he left, washed, and came back seen. His neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar said, Isn't this the one who used to sit begging? Some said, He's the one. Others were saying, No, but he looks like him. He kept saying, I'm the one. So they asked him, Then how were your eyes opened? And he answered, The man called Jesus, made mud, spread it on my eyes and told me, Go to Siloam and wash. So when I went and washed, I received my sight. Where is he, they ask. I don't know, he said. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Pray with me this morning. Lord, the ministry of Jesus made it clear. He came to give sight to the blind. But he also came to blind those who thought they had sight. So, Lord, today... May we all clearly see that we need Jesus. And may we, may we go to others with that good news that he is the light of the world. It's in his name we pray these things. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. So earlier in this series... We have been walking through John's Gospels, and if you'll remember, several of the stories that we covered back in January dealt with the signs that John gave us to point to the reality that Jesus is the promised one, that he is the Messiah. And so in John's Gospel, this story serves as the sixth of those seven signs. As a matter of fact, the seventh sign we'll look at next Sunday. And so a sign, we know it points to a reality. And what the signs did was they authenticated and illustrated who Jesus truly was, what his nature was. Why? John tells us in his Gospels, these are written that you may believe and that by believing that you may have light in his name. And so the first thing that we see Jesus pointing to, the first point today for us this morning is this, is that the light of Jesus shatters the darkness. The light of Jesus shatters the darkness. I love this. It says, as he was passing by, he saw a man blind from birth. Who saw the man? Jesus saw the man. Now, in their culture, if you were disabled in the first century, you could only live on charity. It was the only way you had of making a living. So much like our culture today, there are certain beggars, panhandlers, panhandlers, people who will sit on busy street corners, right? Sometimes they hold up a sign. Uh, sometimes they have a bucket or a bag. Sometimes they try to sell something. But the goal there is for them to be able to eke out an existence. But the only way they can do it is sit on a busy street corner. When the first century, the busiest place to be was near the temple. And the most generous place where people right, were going to worship, right, would be near the temple as well. And so it, it, the entire existence of people who were disabled in Jerusalem was largely sitting on the side of the street begging for an existence so that they could just survive. And what I love is it says that Jesus saw this man. Because like for you and me, what happens to our hearts when we see these beggars by the side of the road is what? After a while, we don't notice them anymore, do we? Our hearts become callous. First time we see him, we might be like, hmm, what's that about? Man, maybe we offer a prayer for him. Maybe we roll down the window, offer him some food, and we may do something. But after a while, after we see him there consistently, we don't notice them anymore. There's an interesting phrase that's come about in our culture in recent days that I think is important because it speaks to our gospel opportunity. It's the phrase, be seen. 
When you tell somebody you are seen, right? You're telling them, I notice you. I care about you. I want to know about your story. And so what's interesting is, is the disciples see this man differently. They see this man as a curiosity. They've seen beggars like this before, especially around the temple. And so to them, this man is a theological question, teachable moment. Hey, rabbi, this is something we wondered about before. They had this relationship with Jesus, so they're going to ask him, right? Who sinned, right? This man or his parents? Because what they had given themselves into is what philosophers call the logical fallacy of the either or, or the logical fallacy of the false dilemma. When you and I encounter a situation, we take what our culture and our tradition has taught us, much as the disciples were doing in this moment, and we're like, hmm, I wonder what this is all about. It's either this or it's that. Here's what I love about the ministry of Jesus. There's another way, isn't there? And Jesus shatters their preconceived notions with this one word, neither. He said it's neither. And so he says, instead, this man was born so that his life might give glory to God. And all of a sudden, we lean into what I think is one of life's hardest questions. We often feel like we're in the dark asking the why, God? Why? Question. There are not easy answers. The Bible warns us repeatedly, right, about coming to, to abrupt conclusions about these things. But we get an incredible hint in this story when we lean into the dark of the hard why God question. And let's be honest, we will all ask that question if you haven't already about some part of your life. I have a friend who's a member of this church. They ask that question about their child. His name is Brian Ball, and I want him to join me here on the platform because literally in my Bible, written next to this passage, right, is the name Benjamin Ball, which is the son of Brian and Rachel. And so, Brian, thank you uh, for agreeing to do this today. Brian's no stranger to many of you. He has served as a trustee, life group leader, co-teaches Coffee House Theology with me on Wednesday night. So, Brian, I hope you're doing well today. Thank you for agreeing to get up here with me well, thank you because I could tell the story for you, but it's your story. Well, so it's always more powerful when it comes uh, from, from you as you bear witness to what God has done. And so give us a little bit of your family story and tell us why this verse is so central to your testimony. Absolutely. Absolutely. Benjamin, uh, Benjamin's our oldest. He's one of the orange sweater. Uh, when Benjamin was born, we knew something was wrong. We knew something was broken. And so they tested him for about 10 months. And at 10 months old, we were holding him in arms in the doctor's office, and they said, your son has cerebral palsy. Uh, he will never walk, and he will wither and die at nine. Mm. And so that was, that was a, yeah. So there's a lot of, right, a lot of dreams kind of shatter on the floor yeah. um, at that moment. And so uh, we, we started praying, and, and I prayed, and I, I told the Lord, look, I'm a big boy. Right. You, you've, you've been faithful to me. You can take anything you want from me. And I mean anything you want from me. Yeah. Heal my son. Yeah. Right? Heal my son. And so God brought me to this verse, right, where John 3, where it says, you know, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this was done so the works of God may be displayed in his life. Yeah. Right? And so cerebral palsy was given to Benjamin so the works of God may be displayed in his life. Hmm. Right? And so what I realized in my prayers was that he was the one that was whole. And I was the one that was so broken. Hmm. Right? Yeah. And so now we see the works of God being done in his life. And you and Tanya have walked through us with this, prayed through us with this. Yeah. You know, in, in grace, he walks closely with the world. Right? He's, he's been a, given a gift. He gets to go places you and I, most of us, never <laughs> yeah. get to go yeah. and witness for the gospel. Right? And, and be that strong presence. And, and I'm not going to tell you CP is a good thing. Yeah. I, I'm not going to tell you. But, but what I can tell you is that God can work through that Amen. to his glory. Right, and I don't know when you look at Benjamin what thread you pull out, and he's not Benjamin anymore. Right, one of those big threads is CP. Yeah, and so you know we're just we are, we are thankful. We're thankful that the Lord has been so merciful with us. Yeah, Amen. Would you give Brian a hand for sharing his story this morning? Thank you, brother. Did you hear what he said? For him, as a parent, there was a journey. God shattering the illusions that he had about who his child was going to be, what his child was going to do. For him, there was a revelation there that I'm, I'm the one who's broken, right? But he's the one that God has created just as he is for a purpose and a reason. And I will tell you, I've spent time with Benjamin Ball. God's glory is uniquely displayed through that young man. There's something about his presence, his intellect. 
He's a graduate of Princeton University. Currently, he is teaching at Eton College in England, teaching the future kings and queens of Europe. That's what this man, how gifted this young man is. And he loves the Lord and bears witness to him and his presence in his life. It's amazing to see how God works in unexpected ways. And so my encouragement to you today, right, is in the wide God questions when we fumble around in the dark is to lean in and know that somehow, some way, God gets the glory. God isn't surprised or thrown off by the things that happen in this broken world. As you heard Brian say, right, cerebral palsy disease is not a good thing. And yet God can take things that are not good and use them for his glory. Amen? The most ultimate example of that, of course, is the cross. So yeah, you can (laughs) amen to that all morning long. And so what a mission Jesus had to show the world and to teach his disciples that reality. And so Jesus goes on to say, right, we must do the works of him who sent me while it is day. There's an urgency to this mission. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And Jesus goes on to follow through by spitting in the mud, making some mud, spreading it on the guy's face. And you say, gross. What is that all about? Because clearly there's nothing magic in the mud. (laughs) There's nothing magic in the spit. But what it was was an enacted parable. You see, Jesus created us from what? The dust. And so what does he do now? He recreates this man's eyes from the dust. And so all of a sudden, and I love this, right? Jesus tells him, hey, go wash in the pool called Siloam, the same pool, right, that the high priest every day that week had been dipping their water in. That idea that he was the living water, the man is obedient. He goes, he washes his eyes, and he comes back seeing, John tells us. It's like so matter of fact. I want to go full pause there for a second. Can you imagine your whole life you've been blind? You've only heard people talk about sunsets. You've only heard descriptions of birds and butterflies. You've only heard the whispers of people describing colors, describing beauty. You've only been able to hear all of these things. And then suddenly the creator touches your eyes, right? You go and wash and all of a sudden you begin to see light. You begin to see faces for the first time. You begin to see colors and all of these things. And this man can see and he runs back to his neighborhood, right? Likely to tell his parents and the other people that he can see. And and this is sad to me. This is tragic. Talk about being seen. The people in his own neighborhood have overlooked him so much, they're not sure that it's even him. Some people are like, wait, isn't this the guy who was blind? So I want to remind you that up to this point in history, no one, had ever been given sight who was blind. It's not recorded a single time in the Old Testament. Nowhere in the annals of history had anybody been healed from blindness before. And so they're like, well, it can't be, right? But so others are like, no, 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 it, it looks like him, right? But he can see, like, it's almost this funny exchange. And the guy has to keep telling them, it's me, it's me. And this leads us to our second point this morning, which is this, is, is that The light of Jesus exposes our self-interest and self-preservation because there's going to be more revealed here. Yes, this miracle proves to everybody, points to the reality that Jesus is the Messiah, that he brings sight to the blind. Only God can do that. And yet at the same time, the blinding light of the glory of Christ will also expose things as well. Remember several years ago, we were having some friends over for dinner and so we were doing the hasty cleanup of the dining room. And so I swept, but maybe I didn't take all the dirt that I swept up. And maybe I swept it under, right, the buffet table and a few other things. Well, it just so happened to be right as we sat in the dining room, the sun was setting in the west and shone right into the dining room to reveal all of those dust bunnies, right? The light exposes, the light exposes things and the light of Christ exposes the hearts here of the Pharisees and of this man's parents. So we continue the story with verse 13. It says, they brought the man, the people in the neighborhood didn't know what else to do, right? So they bring him, who, the man who used to be blind, I love that, to the Pharisees. The day that Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes was a Sabbath. And so John's telling us something's up there. So the Pharisees quizzed him, asked him how he received my sight. Well, he put mud on my eyes. I wash, I can see. And so immediately the Pharisees judge, this man is not from God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. You see, what had happened was by the first century, the Jewish people in their attempts, right, to get back to God 
had not only tried to fulfill the Old Testament law, right? Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, but they had gone to extreme measures. By the first century, the rabbis had developed 39 categories of things that you could not do on the Sabbath day. I'm not talking about things you couldn't do. I'm talking about 39 categories of things you can't do on the Sabbath day. The equivalent in our culture, is anybody here old enough to remember the blue laws that we used to have? So some of you, yeah, show of hands, yeah. So don't be afraid, yes, yeah. So they were called blue laws because originally the Puritans wrote them on blue paper. And so they were laws in the community about what businesses could and couldn't be open on Sundays, the idea that Sunday was supposed to be a special day, right, for Christians to observe worship. And so Chick-fil-A is probably the most famous example now of we have of a corporation that observes that principle. But there were 39 categories of things that you could not do on the Sabbath. One of those was healing. A doctor couldn't do anything on the Sabbath unless it was life-threatening. Number two, and most scholars think this is probably what they were dinging Jesus on, was kneading like dough. And so when he spit and made mud, right, he had to form it into this, this, you know, paste that he put on the man's eyes. And so kneading like dough, right, that was considered work. I mean, you weren't supposed to literally lift a finger. Uh, Anointing is another one that you weren't supposed to do. You weren't supposed to put salve on anything. You You weren't supposed to work with your hands at all. And I know what you guys are thinking, like, this is to the extreme. And yes, it's the reality. This man needed sight, but what did the Pharisees do? Well, they wanted to argue about it. All they could see instead of the miracle that was right in front of them was their own way of thinking. They themselves were a stumbling block to receiving and understanding what God was doing right in front of them. And so often for you and I, our preconceived notions, the way that we think about the world, because we think we've got it all right, is the way that we think things should be. And so that keeps us from recognizing what Jesus is doing. You know, sadly, our own theological tribe, right, is guilty of much the same approach. There's an old joke. What do you have if you have one Baptist? An evangelist. What do you have if you have two Baptists? A Bible study. What do you have if you get three Baptists? A theological controversy, right? And so we have to be careful in our attempt to be about the good things. We can sometimes miss it. And in this moment, the Pharisees missed it. And so the man gives his testimony. And the man shares with the Pharisees what's taking place. And I love the way that he said it, right? In verse 17, again, they asked the blind man, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? He's a prophet, he said. Now, I want you to observe something throughout the story. The man's eyes spiritually are becoming more and more open. The Pharisees become more and more closed. It's how God works as he reveals more and more of himself to us. And so if you don't get the answer from the guy you want, what do you do? You go get his parents. So they haul in the parents and they begin to quiz them and ask them. Verse uh, 19, is this your son, the one that you say was born blind? How then does he now see? Verse 20, we know this is our son and that he was born blind. Thank you, parents, Captain Obvious, for that one. But what we don't know is how he now sees. And we don't know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. And John gives us some context. His parents said these things because they were afraid of the Jews since the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him as the Messiah, he would be banned from the synagogue. This is heartbreaking, right? Because you think about these parents, just like Brian, just like others. Man, don't you want your kid to be perfect and whole? Don't you think they prayed, right, for their son? And now he's been healed the best thing possible, but when they are put on the spot, right, and asked to testify, they cower back. They don't come strong with a testimony. They've seen what's happened, but they themselves are living in fear. Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man proves to be a snare. It's a trap. And they're more interested in pleasing their community in that moment than they are testifying to the Messiah who has changed their son's life. Now, we have to give them the benefit of the doubt. Being cut off from the synagogue would mean you can't come to church anymore. It would mean you were cut off from your family. All of the rich heritage that they had of the festivals and the feasts and all the things they did, their life as they know it would effectively end. And yet at the same time, right, Jesus calls us, calls us to count the cost of what it means to follow him, even if it's hard. 
And that's what's so tragic to me about this moment. They are more concerned with their own self-preservation than they are celebrating what God has done in the life of their son and telling other people about it. So one strike, two strikes, they're going to try again. A third interrogation. Verse 24, so a second time they summoned the man who had been blind and told him, give glory to God. That sounds good, but what that is is an oath. It's pulled from Joshua chapter 7. It's like in our culture, when we take the Bible and we hand it to somebody, right? And we say, put your hand on the Bible and repeat after me, tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help me God, that was the equivalent in the first century. And so that's what they're doing here in this moment. But do they really want to hear an authentic testimony? Nope. We know that this man is a sinner. We've already made our mind up. But I believe that they asked that God so that this could be revealed. But he answered, Whether or not he's a sinner, I don't know. But one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. He bears witness, and his story is all of our stories. At one point, you and I, we were blinded by our sin. We were blinded by our selfishness and our ambition. We were blinded by our addictions. We are blinded by our achievements. All of us who know Christ share his story. We were once blind, but now we can see. Praise God. And so this is the template for our story, our testimony. And what I love is from this point, and same thing happens for us in gospel conversations when we share our testimony, we begin to grow stronger in our faith, don't we? Because we are reciting what God has done for us. And so listen to this man, right? <laughs> so they ask him again, well, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? I already told you, and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want his, to become his disciples too? Oh, isn't it interesting? This man who is the lowest of low in society is standing with the elite and he becomes to be, he comes, starts being bold in his witness. So they ridiculed him. What did they do? They bully him basically, right? You're that man's disciple, but we're Moses's disciples. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but this man, we don't know where he's from. Guy responds, well, this is an amazing thing, isn't it? You don't know where he's from and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he listens to him. Throughout history, no one has ever heard of someone opening the eyes of a person born blind. Translation, Pharisees, you know the verses. You know the passages. You know the histories. This is an uneducated, disabled man who is giving the elite of their culture a schooling in this moment. moment. Boom, roasted as we might want to say. Throughout history, no one has ever heard of someone opening the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he wouldn't be able to do anything. Again, they dismiss him. You were born entirely in sin. Are you trying to teach us? Yes. What do your scriptures say? What does Isaiah 42, 6 and 7 say? I will watch over you and I will appoint you to be a covenant for the people and a light to the nation in order to open blind eyes. You see... One of the most important prophecies about the Messiah to come is that he would restore sight to the blind. And yet, the scriptures that they claim to know so well, the scriptures that they had memorized forwards and backwards, their own arrogance, their own spiritual pride kept them from recognizing that's what was happening right before their very own eyes. Jesus, his light exposes our self-interest. It exposes our self-preservation to where we need to repent from trying to act like we have it all together. And this leads us to the third movement of the story today, which is this. It's that the light of Jesus blinds the arrogant but gives sight to the blind. It gives sight to the blind. So Jesus heard that they had thrown the man out. And when he had found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? I want you to think about the emotional roller coaster this guy had been on, right? Started the day like every other day in his existence. Finding his way to a street near the temple, sitting down and begging. And then this Jesus guy showed up. 
He heard some theological questions, right? And all of a sudden, Jesus rubs mud on his eyes. He goes down, washes in a pool. He can see. All of a sudden, he's swept up into this questioning, into this controversy. And in this moment, he bears witness to Christ. And now he's been kicked out of church for it. Churches get messed up when the wrong kind of people get saved. And so I love this. Jesus goes and finds him. Man, what an example for you and for me. And that the king of the universe went and found this guy. He was even more of a pariah than he was when the day started. He'd now been excommunicated from the synagogue. He was now estranged from his parents. He literally had no one on the greatest day of his life, the day that he received sight at this moment. He's at the lowest of lows, and yet Jesus finds him. Aren't you glad that Jesus found you in your lowest moment? Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't stop pursuing you? You see, sometimes, and I get it in our evangelical shorthand, we'll say, right, I found Jesus. So our senior pastor at Brentwood, Mike Glenn, will say, no, you didn't find Jesus. Jesus wasn't lost. You were. Jesus found you. And Jesus finds this man. And he asks him this question, the invitation question, do you believe Do you put your trust in the son of man, the man? And again, his heart has been opening, his eyes getting more and more wide spiritually throughout the story. Who is he, sir, that I may believe? His heart is open, he's ready. Jesus answered, you have seen him, and in fact, he is the one speaking with you. And here it is. This man's eyesight might have been restored, but he isn't healed until this moment. But now he is with these words, I believe, Lord, he said, and he worshiped him. That's the moment of true healing. And no matter our physical condition, spiritually, that's the moment that changes our lives. And this man is transformed. And Jesus makes it very clear to him, right? The Pharisees, they're not the judges. I came into this world for judgment in order that those who do not see will see and those who do see will become blind. In other words, My light exposes the arrogance of those who in their religiosity and their spiritual pride think they have it all figured out. Those who want to try to get to me by rule following and their own achievements, that's not the way. Of course, the way of rebellion isn't the way either. But the way is the way of grace. Love this, right? There's still some Pharisees sticking around. There's always that guy in the crowd. We aren't blind too, are we, Jesus? If you were blind, Jesus told them, you wouldn't have sinned. But now that you say, we see, your sin remains. In other words, they have seen that Jesus is the one who saves. Now it's their decision, just like it's yours and mine. And so a few things that we need to talk about as we think about some practical takeaways from this story. A little illustration. Several years ago, when our daughter Lexi, yes, that Lexi, the one I have all the stories about, right? And she's good with it, as I've told you guys before. When Lexi was about fourth or fifth grade, they had, were doing eye tests at school, and the optometrist contacted us and said, hey, we need to let you know something. Lexi's got some vision problems. And we weren't surprised by that, her mom and I, because we both wear contacts, glasses, whole nine yards, so it makes sense, right? Our kids are going to have some of the same vision struggles that we have. And so he said, no, 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 but this is different. This isn't something that we can fix with a corrective lens. You see, when Lexi, when she was little, at some point, the muscles around her eyes didn't develop properly. So there's a fundamental underlying issue here. What she needs is not just corrective lenses. She needs something called vision therapy. It's like physical therapy for the eyes. And so for Lexi, when she was trying to read, right, she'd get to the end of a line, and then her eyes, muscles weren't formed properly, weren't trained properly, would jump all over the page. So every time she came to a new line, she had to reset her vision. You know how exhausting that is? And all of a sudden, it became clear to us why she had headaches, why she didn't love to read, all of those kind of things. And so we enrolled her in vision therapy. And over the course of a year, it was fascinating. She was taught all of these exercises to do, watching a tennis ball, right? All of these different things in order to retrain her eyes. And God designed our minds in such a way that the muscles around her eyes were able to be rewired so that she can see. And what a gift that has been. And so she is a great student. She's even a good driver, right? All these things, right? Because the muscles in her eyes now work properly. And in a similar way, you and I spiritually need the muscles, our spiritual muscles around our eyes rewired to number one, takeaway number one, to see the way Jesus sees. 
Jesus saw beyond the category, blind beggar, right? And he saw the person. In Matthew chapter 9, it says, When Jesus saw the crowd, he had compassion on them because they were weary and worn out like sheep without a shepherd. You see, Jesus saw people's spiritual needs. And you and I need to see the spiritual needs and opportunities that God has put around us all the time. So what this pursue campaign is all about. We believe that God is leading us to pursue the very people that he is putting in our path each and every day. So let's see them the way that Jesus sees them. Number two, let's see our own need as well. You know, as I mentioned a moment ago, I have terrible sight. That's why you don't see me wear glasses very often because they are as thick as Coke bottles on the bottom, right? Uh, I'm like negative 6.5 in one eye, negative seven in the other. So I wear contacts, right? But when I was a young boy, when I was in the third grade, I couldn't read what the teacher was writing on the board. And so I got in trouble in class because I was asking my neighbor what he was, she was writing on the board. Why? Because I didn't want to admit that I couldn't see. And spiritually, so many of us are in the same boat. We don't want to admit that we can't see. We don't want to admit that we don't have it right. And so that's what Jesus is pointing out, the arrogance of the Pharisees, the self-preservation of the parents. Instead, we need to admit our own need. For me, being able to see came with the admission, right? I can't see and I need to get some help. And some of you today are in that boat. You are in the darkness you can't see. You're asking the why God question and you don't have any answers or any place to look. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Come to me and I will help you see. And the last but certainly not least, number three, right? We need to see opportunities to share our story. There are opportunities all around us to do exactly what the man born blind did. I was lost, but now I see. The world is longing to hear our story. They want to hear what difference Jesus makes in your life. Brian's story, Rachel Ball's story, is powerful. Why? Because people want to know. What did you do with a son who was born with cerebral palsy? How has that affected your life? How has God used that? And they're able to bear witness, and you have a story, and I have a story. Our stories are not the same, but we have a story, and we need to share that story. You know, there's a pastor who had a story as well. He lived in 17th century England. He had a mother who loved the Lord, who rooted him in biblical truth from a young age, who taught him scripture. But his mother died at, when he was seven years old. And he was bitter and angry. He was asking the why God question in the dark. His father was in the Navy, and so he followed his father into a life on the sea. He started sailing at 11 years old. And so he was trained up to be a sailor. And he talked like a sailor, he cussed like a sailor, he drank like a sailor, and he ran slave ships like a sailor did in that era. And then there was one day that they had a fierce storm that their boat came into. And so at 23 years old, this man by the name of John Newton, right, recalled in his moment that he thought he was going to die the verses that his mother had taught him. He cried out for Jesus to save him, and he did. John Newton finally sailed home, and so through many toils and snares, John Newton had been delivered, and he renounced his old life. He became a pastor. He began to work for the abolishment of slavery in England, and he wrote dozens of hymns, one of which I almost guarantee you know, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind, but now I see. Will you bow your heads with me this morning as we come to this time of response? Because like John Newton, the blind man's story should be all of our stories. And today, if you need to turn from your sin and yourself to a Savior who you can open your eyes, then today is the day of salvation. If you realize today I'm more about my self-interest and self-preservation than I am surrendering to the Savior who came as the light of the world. Then today, leave the darkness. Run to the light of Jesus. It's his grace that saves us. As John Newton knew, we don't deserve it. We don't earn it. We're wretches in our sin. 
There's no hiding it. There's no glossing it over. But God's grace is greater than my sin. And so today, would you respond to the one who's the light of the world, the one who gives sight to the blind. His name is Jesus, and he's here. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this incredible testimony in this story. May you open the eyes of our heart to you. Your grace is amazing, and it's in your name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. Would you stand with us as we sing this incredible hymn in response?